So I think we're, we can start today. Um, I'm pretty happy to be here, and especially that I have more attendees than, I would say, f between five and seven, because I was, two weeks ago, I was uh, holding a, more or less a presentation I do later with my colleague, uh, Laura, about the manager dashboard. Um, and they've invited me to do this talk. And then once I were there, they figured out, oh, it's no, no it's too technical. And um, then no one seemed to join. So that was kind of depressing. So I'm really happy that there are more people interested in Seth in general. Um, so if you're attending to or pretending to fall asleep, feel free to scan this QR code. This is a direct link where the presentation is hosted. Um, it's on GitHub. So if you want to follow on your mobile devices or somewhere else, or if you just want to leave because it's getting boring, you can look up this afterwards. So let's start for today. Um, what I'm gonna talk, talk today is about uh, Ceph, the distributed storage in general, because we sub initially we submitted a talk about the Ceph Manager dashboard, um, which will be held later, um, I guess on one hour from now. Um, and then I realized, okay, there is no general talk about Ceph. So maybe it could be complicated if people would join a talk about a web UI managing a storage they have no clue about. So I submitted another proposal, and this is where I am now. I would like to talk a little bit about Ceph. Agenda for today. Um, first of all, a quick introduction. We'll keep it really short. Then I will stump, start from the basics. It's really basic. If it's too easy, we can jump over to more difficult stuff. So let's just let me know. Um, then what is Ceph and the core components of Ceph? Um, I think this is really useful. And at last but not least, some use cases um, I gathered in the meanwhile. Quick introduction um, about myself. My name was written down already on the slides, so that's nothing new. Um, I'm Kai. I'm obviously working for Zuzi, and there is this nice chameleon in the corner here, so that's kind of obvious. Um, I'm working from Fulda. Um, if you have no clue where Fulda is, Fulda is um, in the middle of Hessia, so I would say in the middle of Germany, more or less. So the good thing is it's the same distance to everywhere. The bad thing is it's the same distance to everywhere. So um, it's a really small town. If you want to reach out to me, um, you can reach me in most of those channels in OFTC or Freenode. Um, nickname, you see, this, see it there. So now it's getting serious. So please listen to me and could get complicated. So this is uh, now the really serious part. You think it was a joke? No, it's not. So please stay calm. It will be interesting. Single NAS system, isn't it enough? I hear this, heard this many, many times. Of course, could be. All, this, all the journey starts with just a single hard drive. So you connect a single hard drive via USB, something like that, two and a half inch or maybe more to your laptop, store all your data, that's it. That's fine, that's cool, that's not scaling. So after quite a while, you buy a bunch of hard disks, combine them, maybe in a USB dongle, whatever, uh, it's also not that fancy. Where, on the other hand, where to put all of those drives? Hmm. First of all, yeah, a dedicated server is needed. So we put all our drives, maybe 8, maybe 24, maybe 96. I don't know, I heard of super micro servers with more than 100, 100 um, disks in just a single chassis. That's amazing, that's cool. Um, but yeah, well, one server, is this really enough? Of course not, we need more. So we need more servers. And then we need a single rack, we need another one, another one, and maybe a hall. So uh, I could get complicated. So of course there's more. First of all, when we have a single, just a single NAS instance, um, we, how do we manage it? Mostly with a single application. We have, a, have a, just one web UI. I'll give you a second. Just take a seat. Um, you have a single web UI to manage the whole system, so that's, that's really cool. But once you deployed more, uh, more servers, more racks, you have, I would say, way too many options. You deployed, I don't know, hundreds of the same web UIs or different web UIs, and you have to manage all of them. First of all, in a small company, this is kind of rather easy to administrate, um, but later on, this gets rather complicated. In general, for a bottom line, there are two ways of scaling. I hope that everyone knows about it, but just to walk through, um, there is scale up. There's a difference between scale up and scale out. First thing is scale up. Um, 
easiest thing, you have a single chassis and you put more stuff in it. More RAM, more CPU power, more this, you just scale it up. That's the idea of scale up. The other one is scale out. Opposite, just putting more nodes um, besides the other one, and then you could scale out your storage system. At the beginning, that's cool, but after quite some while, just a single administrator is not enough anymore. So one admin couldn't handle the whole needs that you have. So what are you going to do? That's easy. You hire more people. That's cool. Then you have a storage team. That's amazing, but not that exhausting sometimes. So I had the hope there was something better and we could do better, and of course there is. And now there's a simple question, and I hope this is easy. What's that? Yeah, amazing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the icon of Seth, and I just removed the Seth underneath, which was quite hard. Took me quite some skim skills to remove it. Um, yes, indeed, that's Seth. So let's talk about Seth. What is it? Everyone is talking about it. It's like a little bit like Kubernetes. It's a cool buzzword, so what the hell is it? In general, um, Ceph is a distributed object storage. I guess if you heard or read something about Ceph, you read this already. Sounds cool, but I don't know what it means. I have no clue. So also it's a unified solution. So you have object, block, and um, file storage in a single solution. Or unified. That's cool as well. That's all we wanted all the time. Unified, just a single solution. That's amazing. Cool. And what's really important, um, and that's from the document as well, officially. It's designed for performance, reliability, and scalability. I guess there's no buzzword missing, so it must be the perfect solution. Um, the initial principles of Ceph were um, to build a system that scales horizontally. So it's made for scale out. That's what you see, and to put more and more nodes in it. That's where all the, the strengths of Ceph come to take in place if you're adding more and more nodes. It's not made to, to scale only on a single or a two node system, it doesn't make sense at all. So the more nodes you add, the better Ceph gets. That's the point. Um, from the beginning, it was designed to be without a single point of failure. Um, so um, there are some, if you talk about how you access the data, yes, that's true. But the underneath, how your data is distributed, there is no single point of failure. Um, the cool thing is, I guess with almost every open source um, solution, you can run it on commodity hardware. So just buy your hardware from your hardware vendor, and that's fine. Also, it runs on ARM, for example. So that's, that's perfect. Um, Ceph is made to be self-managed. Mostly, in most situations, it's self-managed. Sometimes, when it's not self-managed, then it's getting really complicated. So, um, but the design is made for it, and it's licensed under the LGPL. Um, one thing to understand is that the most important thing within Ceph is that Ceph trades off everything for consistency. So, um, the first thing Ceph tries to do is to save and to secure your data, whatever will happen. So, this could lead, for example, that you couldn't um, write data to your cluster anymore just because Ceph tries to secure your data and to secure you for, from losing data. So first principle is it trades off everything for consistency. This is the, I would say, the, the slide you've seen in so many Ceph presentations. But for those of you who have never seen that before, um, let's start from the underneath the red box. That's Rados. Um, Rados is, as you can think of, it's the, I would say, the backend part of Ceph. So how the replication is done, how the data is stored, um, that's the whole, the whole backend. And written, Rados is a cool name. It's a reliable, um, autonomous, distributed object storage. So rather complicated name, but make it short. Call it Rados, that's the back backend. Um, that's cool, but we would like to get our data back, or at least we would like to put some data into our cluster. And how we do that? There are several ways. First of all, there was Liberators, and Liberators is a library um, where you can directly access the cluster, cluster and do interactions with your cluster. You can use um, C, C++, Python, whatever you want, um, and interact with Liberators to put data into, get data out of it, um, and to modify whatever you want. Then the second thing is the Rados Gateway. Um, Back in the past, a few years back, there was only one way 
external gateway to access your data, your objects. So obviously, how should we call it? Underneath, it's called Rados, so we call it Rados Gateway. Nowadays, this is sometimes mixed because nowadays people intend to call it the object gateway, but it's the same. So if you hear the name object gateway, it's the same as the Rados gateway, so don't get confused um, because after time it was evolving. Um, third thing is RBD. RBD is a replicated block device. Um, what does it mean? It's the block device. So if you need a, a device for your virtual machines, for your host, whatever, you can directly map a dedicated block device to your machines, format it with your file system and use it. Um, and it looks like it, it's just a usual block device. There's no difference. The application has no clue that at the back end all the stuff is stored in objects. Last but not least, there is ZFS. This is a POSIX compliant file system. Um, which in the meanwhile is production ready and can be used. Um, this is a file system on top of, of Ceph um, and can be used for directly accessing the data instead of putting, I don't know, mapping an RBD to another node, formatting it with a XFS, X4, whatever, and then sharing the data. Um, those are different ways to, I would say, put data into the cluster and get data out of the cluster. But in the meanwhile, there are some more. Um, it's also possible to set up an iSCSI gateway. Um, they could share the RBD lands via iSCSI, um, for example, to any solution you would like. Um, then there is an NFS gateway um, based on NFS Ganesha, um, where you can also share your data via NFS. And what's currently also what's still work in progress, but I think it's already declared stable as um, Civ Samba, so not in the UI, but at least in Ceph in general. So you can also create Civ Samba shares um, to share your data. Mm. For NFS, it's good to know right now in NFS or the current implementation of this NFS thingy is not made to be a replacement, for example, for your data store for your virtual environment. This was initially made to just convert your data, if, first of all, into the Ceph cluster and from there into, I would say, directly objects via the Rados gateway. So the performance is better than it was, but it's still not that good. So if you expect, I don't know, to replace your existing um, comprehensive uh, storage, mm, that could be tricky. Or you stuff enough SSDs and NVMEs into it, then that's possible, yeah. Let's talk about Ceph core components because there are several ones and um, sometimes that could be kind of confusing um, because Ceph could be a complex beast, I would say. Um, first of all, we have monitors. Um, the monitors obviously monitor the cluster and tracks the, the health of the cluster. That's why they call a monitor. You always have to, an, have to have an odd number of monitors. Yes, you can start with one. That's possible. Um, you can do that for development systems. I would not recommend to do this in a productive environment. So please, bare minimum should be three, and then five, seven, nine. I think everyone knows what odd number is. Um, Second thing they retain is the, uh, is the general maps of the cluster, so the current epoch of the cluster, the current state, the actual, the actual state, the real state, um, that's part of the month, and then they are reliable for the distribution of the data. That's what the months are for. One really important part, and you should, better, should not mix this up, months do not serve any data at all. They are not within the data pass. So if you connect the client and you want to get data out of your cluster, you will not get this data from the month. So um, just to keep that in mind. Second thing is an OSD. What is an OSD? Mm, OSD is an object storage daemon. That's what it's written. Um, OSD stores all the data on the physical disks. Um, just give me an example. Um, usually, if, if we talk, or if in a Ceph terminology, if you talk about an OSD, this usually means an OSD node. This, this is a one storage node with a bunch of disks, doesn't matter, and this is an OSD node. And you could also say, okay, a single disk is an OSD. You can also format the single disk into several partitions. Um, and spawn three, four, five, seven, I don't know how, how many petitions you would like to make, um, OSDs on top. Per device, you get one process. So 
example, I have 1,000 physical disks, and I would like to have on each physical disk one OSD, I would end up with 1,000 OSD processes in my cluster, and this scales out to hundreds of thousands. Within the OSDs, the, re the replication mechanism is included, so how to replicate the data from A to B, from B to C, so this logic is within the OSDs. And as I already said, bare minimum, please, should be three and not less. I know one is an odd number, but please don't. Next thing above OSDs is pool. What is pool? Um, that's obvious. We have those terminology in, in other storage languages as well. That's just a logical container. So you can put OSDs within a pool and create pools. And um, you can fi define two different, um, I would say, versions of pools. One is replicated. Replicate means you just store one object over there, the second object, the same exact same copy on the second OSD, second disk, the second uh, availability zone somewhere, for example. Second thing is erasure coded. This is a little bit, um, I think you can compare it with, with RAID, RAID 6, for example. You can scale this up. Um, initially, your object will be splitted into whatever you have defined, and then um, you can define how many chunks you would like to um, have as well. So it's comparable to, I would say, a RAID. So you have to store less than with and just traditional replicated pools. You can add dedicated crush rules to pools. Um, I just want to point it out here, and I would like to explain what crush is in a yeah, few minutes. With pools, another important thing is placement groups. And placement groups is all, all most of the time if I talk about placement groups, people tend to be confused because uh, why do I need pools and then placement groups and what's the difference and how the data is replicated. Um, in general, really abstract, really easy. Um, a placement group is just, I would say, a helper to distribute the data on your OSDs. Um, just, just as an example, you have a single cup with several cubes of ice cream, for example. Um, each cube would be an object. The cup, the whole, whole cup, which could have, I don't know, 10 cubes, for example, of ice cream, um, is our placement group. So it's just another abstraction layer to make it easier. Um, a typical, typical placement group um, can spawn several OSDs, or typically spawn several OSDs, on, on an, and an OSD has several PGs, so vice versa. Recommended, I would say recommended, are between 100 and 150 placement groups per OSD, which means 100 and 150 of those dedicated groups per disk. Um, so if you imagine you have, I don't know, 100, for example, you should have at least um, an, a multiple of two. So it would, get, would be good to get to 8,192 or something like 16,000 um, for the PG count. That's sometimes confusing, and hopefully with the next releases, this with the whole PG merge functionality, this problem will completely go away, and you don't have to mess with those problems anymore, because in the past, um, people struggled when they created initially their pool, pools. They had no clue how to collect, cl um, calculate the PGs. They just entered a random number, and then they figured out, oh, maybe this is the wrong number, or it was quite too high. The problem is nowadays you can just exceed the number, you, but you can't reduce it anymore. So then you're stuck, and you have to create a whole new pool and shuffle your data around, and this will go away with the new Ceph, um, PG merge functionality. Crush map was already mentioned. This is also, I don't know why they have those amazing, really complicated names that no one can remember. Um, it's a controlled replication under scalable hashing. Sounds also very cool and promising. Um, and as I already said, the, the mons maintain the crush map. What does it mean? Um, imagine you have three availability zones in your company or at your place, and you would like to replicate your data across all of them, all three data centers, you want to uh, replicate your data. Then you can use cr Crush to build your topology from the data center to the racks, to the to, uh, down to a single server, single OSD, um, that's possible. So you can define, I would like, if I have my first pool created, this is a replicated pool of rep size of three. Every time I put a single object into that pool, it will be replicated into each availability soon. Then I can create another pool, for example, 
where I think it's not that important. I only need one cop uh, two copies somewhere. I don't mind if it's in this one second or a third data center, just somewhere, just two copies. I don't care. So that's something you can define. It's totally flexible and mostly it fits on, I would say, on all environments. So it's completely flexible. One thing maybe worth to mention. Um, Initially, you have to think about how your craft map should look like. Um, and this, this could change while you're adding more nodes and you have new ideas. But every time you change the craft map, please keep in mind that this could shuffle around your data completely. And imagine you have a petabyte or several petabyte cluster, and it just changed a single line, and you want to re-replicate re your data because you thought it was a great idea, and you click apply afterwards, or it, I would say you apply the new craft map to the cluster, this could lead to frustration for your clients and your end users because sometimes those clusters are stuck for weeks because there is no undo. So there, there, is this, there is no possibility to say, okay, I don't like this idea anymore, please um, undo back to the old configuration. Uh -uh. You have to wait until it's done. So think about it before you do that. Please, just an advice. So here we have a small cluster. Um, those red bubbles are OSDs, I would say, just single disk. This is a single disk, single OSD disk. Um, then we have an odd number, three monitors. That's cool. Now we would like to write some data to the cluster. How does it work? Um, the client writes the data always to the primary OSDs. So there's always one OSD is the primary one. Um, then it writes the data to the primary one. The primary one with the logic behind, as I explained, um, will take care of the replication to all the other OSDs. For in this example, I defined I would like to have a replication size of three. So I want to have three copies of my object. Then it will replicate the data to the other two OSDs, will gather the acknowledgments, and then it will get back to the client and say, hey, I wrote your data. I'm fine. It's cool. A little bit different for reading the data. That's the cool thing about um, you don't have to read your data just from the primary OSD. You can read the data from any OSD where this object belongs. So um, this max out the speed and you can paralyze it. So um, the read, um, I would say, operations uh, are quite faster than the write operations, obviously. Use cases for Ceph. There are several ones. I guess the most famous one is the backend storage for OpenStack. Um, that I guess it's used in, I don't know, I, I've read some numbers f uh, a few weeks ago, something like 60, 70% of all open, OpenStack deployments have um, Ceph um, at the backend. So this is really fully famous uh, example. Um, then with Ceph it's possible to have I wouldn't say um, an integration, but what does it mean with the Rados gateway or the object gateway? Um, you can have an S3-like gateway, so you can completely integrate it. So what people intend to do is use their cluster as storing their data for their um, S3 applications, for example. That works just out of the box. Then backend, st backend storage for VM, as I said, via iSCSI. Performance of iSCSI is really, really good. Um, as I said, why not mentioning NFS, I explained already. Um, it's not, I would say, product, I would say, ready to replace your existing um, storage system. Also, um, a widely used thing is for video streaming or in, in general storing a lot amount of data on it. Um, that's exactly what Ceph is made for. DR solutions, so the disaster recovery solutions and backup, of course, it scales out. It scales out to as many data centers as you wish like. So that's the perfect, perfect idea for it. And obviously, if uh, you say, okay, I don't care about performance, I can use old hardware that I still have with data disks in it, for example, you can use it for an archive just to have an archive or um, backup of your data from within your um, software. Um, let me check. Yeah, with that, that, I think I already went through. So 
any questions regarding staff in general, the core components. I know this was just a really rough overview, and if you're interested to talk about a little bit more, please grab me. I'm always interested to talk about. And um, yeah, please let me know if you have any questions. Yes. Um, I, I think so. Or should I just repeat it? I don't know. Can we? Let me check if this is working. No, it took. Some. Let's give it a try if it's. Okay, so uh, Theft is uh, new for me. I know the theory and I'll read for about that, but I haven't used them before. So my question is about we had a, a picture at the beginning where we saw these librados, RBD, also different. Uh, Backends or, or uh, frontends, and how is this? Uh, how does this fit with, for example, the write process? Because I don't understand where is, for example, this app, or where is this VM? How does this fit this picture with the write process, for example? Um, so when you connect a, to understand this, um, when you connect a client to um, a cluster directly, um, depends on how you connect it. Um, if you connect it directly and you use the um, built-in uh, libraries, then, for example, the clients connects or gets in touch with the mons and gets the current version of how the cluster looks like. That's so-called an ep epoch. And then it directly communicates to the cluster. Um, if you do that via, for example, um, a mapped RBD device, or I would say iSCSI, Best example is why um, iSCSI mapped as the data store for your virtual environment for VMware or KVM, Proxmox, whatever. Then you contact the iSCSI gateway, and the iSCSI gateway will get the data for you, and then it reports back to you. Because the application on top, for example, VMware, has no clue that there is an object behind, because it didn't know it. There is no driver will tell them, no library. They just think, OK, this is a stupid block device. Please give me this data. And then at the end, this will be translated by the gateway. Another question. More questions. Yes. Uh, give it back to you. Sorry. Uh, because I didn't see there the virtual machine, it is also a possibility or intention to have this client with containers to make it. Uh, okay. uh, there you hit hit the perfect perfect spot. Yes. Um, upstream currently is working on um, moving the whole Ceph. Uh, I would say architecture onto containers because containers will solve everything. Unicorns, ice cream for everyone. Um, so I guess you heard already with Kubernetes, this will solve no problems at all anymore. So yes, we're moving towards containers as well. So um, the idea is, or the, the, the idea is to have, for example, a single container for a single OSD, four months, and so on. And it can do easily upgrades, for example. Um, and right now we are struggling and figuring out what's the best way to deploy all those things because you need some kind of an orchestrator. Um, for example, that comes Rook in mind. If you take a look at the mailing list, Rook is uh, under heavy discussion. I guess it makes good sense to deploy those things. Um, and yes, this is this is work in progress and. Uh, Hopefully, there sooner than later if you talk to our product managers. <laughs> five, five minutes left, so we still have a few minutes to ask a question. How OSD stores the data? How OSD stores the data? Mm, that's, that's different. In the past, there was a file system on top needed. So before you were able to use an OSD, you had to put a file system. Recommended was XFS on top, and then you had a separate journal device. Um, for, this, for every OSD, you had a separate journal, de journal device. Um, with the Luminous release, that's something we'll talk later about, um, this completely changes. With Luminous, there was so-called Blue Store introduced. And Blue Store is the, it's not a file system anymore, but to make it easy, it's a new file system. So you don't need to put a file system on top. And it will directly store the data into, um, into the OSD. Um, via Blue Store. So that's the separate mechanism, so there is no file system on top needed anymore. Yes. Yes, every, every, every write or read is done by a checksum. So it's, it's hashed, and then it's uh, stored onto the disks. That's done by, by every write. And then with Blue Store, you have the um, database, and you had to have a separate write ahead lock you can put, for example, on NVMEs to max out your speed, for example, for specific workloads, and that's possible, and there is no need for a single file system. Or if you're interested, 
Um, we can talk about this later in the hallway. One minute, so one last famous words from someone. Otherwise, I hope this was helpful. And if you're interested to learn more about how the UI on top to manage this and to make it maybe usable for non-Linux experts or non-Ceph experts, join the uh, presentation later together with my colleague, Laura. Thank you very much.